Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to Punch, Kick, Choke, Chat. Uh, we have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful night lined up for you tonight. Uh, I'm super excited. My name is Sean Benson, and I'm one of your hosts tonight. Um, before uh, I get to my weekly pleasure of introducing Sensei Nicholas Suino, I don't want to take anything away from Sensei Dauphin, who, uh, who, who always introduces our guest, but all of our guests are people for whom rubber has met the road. They're all people who have figured out a way that martial arts is real in their life, not just a concept and rubber meets the road. And while Sensei Dolphin is going to talk about the ways that our guest uh, has made rubber meet the road, um, 61 times in the ring, he's made canvas meet his opponent's face. Um, so I'm going to leave that uh, for Sensei Dolphin to expand on, uh, but it always excites me uh, the different ways our guests find to make this thing activate. And uh, it, it's pretty exciting the way our guest tonight has. That said, I'm going to talk about Sensei Suino right now. He's an eighth dan in Iaido. He's a sixth dan in Judo, a sixth dan in Japanese Jiu Jitsu. And I like pondering what I'm going to say each week because it's a pleasure to think about my relationship with this man. And actually, I want to talk about something that is both utterly the realm of the martial arts, but outside of the realm. And it's this long before he knew my rank before he knew my name, before he knew what I did for a living. They always say you can tell how uh, someone's character is by how they treat the wait staff, how they treat the maid. He didn't know who I was. And he treated me just as well in the first day, the eighth day, the 10th day before he knew who I was as he does now um, that we've known each other for over 20 years. And I just think that that's a real testament to the character of Sensei Nicholas Suino. Sensei Suino, how are you? Doing oh, great, Sean. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, I think this is a little unfair. Uh, you, you're getting so good at making these introductions. I feel like everything I do after that is <laughs> it's going to seem a little weak. Um, tone it down next week. <laughs> tone it down. Yeah, tone it down. Um, you could, uh, uh, you know, I'll try not to commit any um, any Zoom any Zoom sins tonight, so I won't give you any fodder to to take the conversation in a bad direction. <laughs> um, it falls to me each week to introduce uh, Randy Dauphin, who is. Um, as most people on the call probably know, um, uh, many, many time uh, a karate champion, both in fighting and forms, um, long-term student of Hunchy Gary Legacy, who's in the middle of my screen up here right now, who really made all of this possible, brought us all together uh, uh, many, many years ago to make this and many other things possible. Uh, Randy studied Eida with me for many years. Um, I hearken back to, gosh, I don't know, a year and a half, two years ago, um, Randy came down to Michigan and we went up to do some steelhead fishing together in the Muskegon River on the west side of Michigan. And um, that is, it might have been February. We tend to do it in really cold weather because that means nobody else is on the water. So, um, and I told him it was cold, but I'm not sure he understood what, what it meant to be out there on the river in February <laughs> for eight or nine hours. Um, and I don't know what whether Randy was wearing any any uh, polypropylene long underwear under his jeans, but I think I had a snowmobile suit, uh, some <laughs> some fleece, uh, uh, some some silk underwear, and some and some warm and fuzzy socks on. And Randy fished the whole day with with blue jeans on, and somehow didn't die, um, and didn't complain either. And I guess that's the point: is he was there hanging out with us the whole day. We had a great time, and he hung in there the whole day. Yeah. And I caught the first fish. Yes, you and did. I, I caught the most fish on the first okay. day. Okay. Hey. All right. I'm sorry I brought this up. <laughs> oh, with that said, Randy, off to you. Thanks so much, Sensei. You know, those moments like where um, obviously we trade a lot of moments in the dojo, which are ones that you can't, you can never replace those. But uh, I'm very grateful that with my teachers, I get to share these personal moments too in their lives, with their in their homes, with their family. Um, that's the thing that's really great about martial arts when you build a true relationship with your teachers is that it's more than just, of course, we've all kicked and punched and choked and chatted, um, but we've done it in lots of different places, not just the dojo. But uh, so thanks so much for that since, you know, that's a great memory. Um, I, that was a great trip. I had a blast in my blue jeans. Um, <laughs> catching lots of fish with you. Uh, I always get to introduce the uh, Sense of Legacy and the Guest of Honor, which tonight is Jean-Yves uh, one of my personal heroes. But uh, 
When it comes to Hunchy Legacy, things that if you don't know, he's reached the pinnacle of rank in martial arts. So he's a 10th then awarded by his teacher, Anthony Sandoval. He's a member as is Johnny Viterio. They're both members of the uh, Canadian Black Belt Hall of Fame. Uh, they're both authors, but this is Sensei Legacy's newest book that's, that's out right now, which uh, if you haven't had a chance to read it, if you're a good fighter and you read it, you're going to find something just a little extra in there that's going to help you out and you should, uh, you should grab it. It's just every time you can get one thing extra, right? Uh, he was a student of Harold Warden. He was a student of Benny Allen. He was a student of Richard Kim. And he, as I mentioned, he's still a student of Anthony Sandoval. Um, born in Jacket River, New Brunswick. Very close to where jean Viterio was born. Both good Acadian Canadians. Uh, I often say that I'm really proud to be a Sensei Legacy student and you know you wonder why it's not just because he's a great martial artist it's because of the human being that he is. Uh, one thing that occurred to me was when his grandson Jaden Legacy was in in peril at a time in his life Sensei Legacy stopped everything that he was doing in his life to have his grandson brought to him um, at a young age and went through the whole process to adopt his grandson and become the legal guardian of his grandson and raised his grandson up. And his grandson now is a fine young man and a really good martial artist, uh, has a great job, has a good girlfriend, is now a productive member of society. This is something that not the average person does. Um, this, he did this later in his life too. Uh, when it comes to the training, uh, I always think of Kyoshi, Adet Rice, and, you know, there's train tracks in the way. I can't make it to the dojo. That's not Sensei Legacy's way. He's traveled regularly from London to Hamilton and Toronto to access teachers. He's gone to New York City um, to meet uh, Nakayama and Sato and train in the Kyokushinkai system. When he first met Sensei Sandoval, he had to travel all the way down to Florida. And then since then, he's trained with him in Kentucky and Minnesota and North Carolina. When he trained with Richard Kim, he regularly had to fly to San Francisco uh, to go train with him. He's traveled to Okinawa and trained with Taba Sensei and Ikihara Sensei. The train tracks don't stop him from getting the knowledge that he needs to get. Um, for me, a moment uh, that he'll remember when I bought my first home, it had a really crappy roof. He came and said, Randy, your roof is really shitty and everything that you own is under that roof. He came up on the roof with me. He took all the shingles off of the roof, helped me put all the shingles back on the roof. And I remember on the second day, just sitting on the peak as the two of us were up there, just hammering the final shingles and just how happy I was and grateful that he would come up there and do that with me. Um, and so thank you, Sense of Legacy. And that's my introduction for, for Sense of Legacy. And now I want to get into um, the champ, Johnny Viterio. Born in Pla Plackettville, New Brunswick, just like Hanchi Legacy, just miles from each other. It's incredible that New Brunswick could produce two such amazing martial artists. Uh, he's the second youngest of six boys. Uh, tragedy early on in his life and adversary. His father died when he was very young, um, and he and his brothers were put in foster care. But uh, the thing about that is his mother went to university, became a nurse, and then gathered them all back together, much how Sense of Legacy did with his grandson, brought all the children back together. Um, as a teenager, he found his way into Hanchitarian's dojo in Vanier. Vanier, if you don't know Vanier, that's, that's a tougher inner city dojo. That's not a place where you just wander around unless if you, can take, you can't take care of yourself. But these struggles were something that he turned into uh, a 26 time world middleweight kickboxing champion. As Sean was alluding to, he had 76 fights. 69 of those were by one, uh, were one, and 61 of the people that he faced were knocked out and their faces were in the canvas. And the one thing I wanna say about that is not a specialist. He knocked people out with his left hand, his right hand, his right foot, and his left foot, multiple people with all of those hands and feet. Not just right hand, right hand, right hand. Um, his third fight with Kerry Roop was 
who at the time was a light heavyweight champion, was televised on the wild world of sports and viewed by 80 million people. 80 million people viewed that sport and that fight. Yeah, that's something that not, that's two times the population of Canada watched him fight that fight. <laughs> in his own words, in reading his, his book, His words of himself, he said he was a fundamentalist. Um, I think when I watched him, he was a fundamentalist. And I also think that he had extraordinary defense. Yes. If you watch the fights, very rarely is he not moving forward. He's always moving forward and he's always imposing his will on the person in front of him. I always like to give my thoughts. <laughs> If I could have anyone else on this call, just one person to have this call with us, I would choose Muhammad Ali. Because in my mind, growing up, those are the two greatest fighters that I ever had the chance to watch was Muhammad Ali and Jean Yves Terrio. And if, if I could have one person, he's the person that I would have on the call with us tonight. The first fight I ever saw was because my parents had first choice TV. <laughs> yes, back first in the choice. day. And my stepdad said to me, Randy, you say you want to be a martial artist? You should watch this fight that's coming up. And it was his fight against Rodney Batman Baptiste. That was in 1984, and I was 13 years old. And after I watched that fight, that was it. I wanted to be a martial artist more than anything in the world. I wanted to be a martial artist. With Hanchi Legacy, I had the first time I had the chance to meet the champ was in Ottawa. And he was fighting one of his students, Benoit LaRouche. And uh, it was for charity. And they made thousands of dollars for the Make-A-Wish Foundation. On that card was also um, Sensei Wally Sloki and Grandmaster Bill Superfoot Wallace. I can tell you that it was a crazy experience to have Sensei Legacy grab my arm and pull me up the stairs and step into the ring and go have a picture taken with my boyhood hero. It's a moment I'll never forget. Having said all that, the next day, what I noticed was that the champ carried all his own equipment into Capital Conquest to teach. He was coming up the escalator and he had all these kick shields and punch bags and he was bringing that up himself. The 26 time world champion was carrying his own bags and his own fighting equipment in to teach. Uh, recently, Hanchi Legacy and I had the opportunity to go to his club. Um, it was amazing to walk into that dojo and just look at him, see him in his element. Uh, we had the opportunity to meet his beautiful wife, Leslie, who was so nice to us and, and talked to us. He gave us these wonderful t-shirts he gave us these books. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, the other thing about uh, the champ is he's very approachable. He's not behind a wall. He's not, when you go to the places where he is, you can go up to him and you can talk to him and he's very friendly and he's very open to talking to people. Um, he's already given so much to Canada and to us in and out of the ring. Um, he doesn't need to do something like punch, kick, choke, chat, but yet here he is doing it with us. Um, and in the end, I guess what I want to say is lots of people get the chance to meet their heroes and they're, they're disappointed. Mm -hmm. And I am not disappointed in meeting my hero. I am not disappointed at all. Uh, every chance I've had to meet him, it's just gone up the, the elevation of how I feel about him. So thanks so much, champ. That's my introduction for uh, the 26 time world champion, Johnny Viterio, one of the greatest combat athletes in Canadian history. Um, take it away, Sean. Great. I'm just going to do some quick housekeeping notes so we can get into the meat of this. Uh, first off, there'll be uh, a chance for y'all to ask questions. Basically, beginning now, we've already got some people firing them in. So at the bottom, you can see there's a chat button on your screen. So please send those questions in. Uh, and, and if they're good and if we have time, you know, we're, we're sticking to a, a tighter format, which we're really happy about. So make sure you get those questions in earlier. We might not get to them. And also, 
This is punch, kick, choke, chat. This is uh, friends and new friends shooting the shit. And if you don't like the content, um, you can take it up with your own internal demons because you apparently have some because this is great content. So uh, we're going to leave it right there. Uh, Sensitario, uh, I always love to ask the guests, you know, you, you don't just have information being spoken about you. You have it spoken from, from all of us, but, but especially someone who's such a genuine fan. How does it feel to be introduced that way? Well... First of all, thank you so much for uh, the invitation. I'm really very honored uh, having uh, listened to some of the, the, the shows in the past uh, and some of the people that I've, I've uh, admired. Uh, I'm very, very honored. Um, and Randy's words and, and, and uh, Nicholas's words as well are uh, um, very humbling, um, but uh, like uh, Master uh, Lagasse will say, we're true, uh, we're true Ac uh, Acadians. This is a, uh, this is the way that we are. You go down east, and uh, this is the uh, prevailing attitude. That people are very nice, very friendly, and my mom would kick my ass if I wasn't. Simple, simple as that. Right on. So, um, you know, I've read some sections from your book and, and it's out there for people to read, but uh, I love uh, our guests basically taking us what brought them into the dojo. But because you've got this information out in, in your book, let's say, what I wouldn't mind you also talking about is how do you think the way you grew up and, um, you know, the foster care and your mom come finding you again and, and some of that being tougher. So if you want to talk about what brought you into the dojo, but also what part of that young life helped you be a fighter, be the man you are? Well, um, at, at, uh, I think I was five years old. My father died. And uh, evidently, mom with the six boys, uh, being the responsible person that she is, she moved uh, her, uh, her team to, from um, northern Ontario to Ottawa, where she went to university, of course, and uh, in the meantime, the state or the, the, the province took us away because she was killing herself. Uh, she was going to school during the, during the day. She was working at night and it was impossible for her to have en enough energy to take care of uh, six boys and rambunctious boys. And so uh, we were taken away, put in foster homes, uh, sometimes uh, with one of our siblings and sometimes alone. And uh, those are, I was telling uh, Randy this a little while ago, those were very marking uh, moments in my life. Uh, I understood that, uh, you know, these people were accepting me in their home, not necessarily because they wanted to have uh, another child, but they wanted to have some income, <laughs> simple as that. And, and, you know, God bless them. He took care of us. I had four or five foster homes. There was one that was, uh, slightly dangerous because the gentleman was an alcoholic and beat his wife and blah, blah, blah. And we were taken out of that really, really quick. Uh, but all the other ones were very, very nice and uh, we were well served. You know, it's, 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 a, uh, it's a strange thing because uh, people, when hearing that you were part of a foster home system, oh, you poor boy, blah, 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 blah. No, back off. Uh, we weren't poor in, in any sense except the emotional side. Uh, we were fed, we were housed, we went to school, we had quote unquote friends. Uh, and only in later years do you realize that the, that emotional uh, support that the child, children need was missing. I was uh, 35, 40 years old until I realized it. And I, you know, thinking about it and, uh, and so, uh, those, those years were formative years for me. I understood mm -hmm. that these, these people are taking care of me for the time being, and next year I'll be somewhere else, and the year after I'll be somewhere else. And it dawned on me, even at a young age, that I uh, am alone. I'm alone in, in this life. Uh, I have relationships, uh, my, my brothers, my mom, my friends, uh, but I, would, I came into this world alone. And I will leave alone and between I will have some amazing relationships and, and, and I'll meet some great people and not so great people, uh, but I have to take care of myself. And so that mentality um, was very, very helpful when I was in my training for a particular fight. I mean, 
you know, I, I would work out an hour and a half, two hours in the gym, uh, just for that, just for the, the technical part. And uh, it doesn't really matter who was visiting, who dropping in. Uh, John or my trainer, Guimalet, would say, you know, back off. He's going to be with you in an hour when his workout is finished. And because I was really, really, really focusing on what I had to do. And I, I, I really dissected that sport from one end to the other. And um, um, so when somebody visited, except for my mother, I would stop everything for my mother. Um, everybody else, uh, Mr. Terry, my manager, or, or Guy, my trainer, would uh, say he'll be with you in an hour. And so the, the, the ability to, to concentrate and focus with that sense that I will be alone in this ring. doesn't matter if there's 15,000 people in the ring or uh, in the arena tra- uh, cheering for me or you know a couple of million people watching the fights. It doesn't matter. I'm alone in this ring. And so that, that, would, that was a, a, a mentality that stuck with me that was really part of my training. And I just worked with that. Uh, over the years, I, I studied uh, sports, psychology just to, sports psychology just to understand what was making me sort of tick and why, why is it that I think this way and why is it, you know, that other athletes don't think this way and so on and so forth. So, you know, it, it, it all sort of came, all these things all sort of came to a, to a, to a head in the same direction. Every element that I have, that I've experienced in the past, everything pointed in that particular direction. I'm going to the top and nothing's going to stop me. So I'm, I'm fascinated by this and I, and I don't want to like live in your childhood too, too long, but would it be fair to say that, you know, in many ways, the Iceman idea was formed before you even started training. And then my other question is when you started to know at a certain age that those feelings were something that were, you weren't facing as much. And as they started to come to the front, did you have to change how you trained because now you have to deal with all this stuff? Well, you're right. Uh, you know, the the uh, the Iceman was at a, an incubation part, <laughs> uh, and I, I not certain. And, and this is my nature. I think uh, I don't know how much of an impact it has on me as a human being, as a, as a as a man. Uh, I think I'm just a you know a quiet sort of non-assuming person until I have to do something that get gets people's attention, and. Uh, it, 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 it just sort of, uh, when, I, when I first started fighting and the name was given to me by, by an opponent, um, I, uh, there, that was another, a complete other um, phenomenon. I had to separate the Iceman from Jean-Yves because the Iceman is, and I'm talking to him about him in the third party, not very pleasant. Uh, not very sociable, very, very focused, not um, um, inviting or, or anything like that. It's completely the opposite from who I am, if I may, you know, just slap my own garters here. Um, and that was a bit of a stretch. Uh, that was a bit of a stretch uh, because um, my friends, maybe not so much my family, my brothers, but my friends and people around me, uh, when I started, you know, having some uh, a certain amount of fame around this, uh, looked at me differently and treated me differently, and it's like, you know, oh wow, we saw we saw him on a magazine cover or we saw him on TV. Him is still me, and so I had to at one point I had to you know put him against the wall and say, hey, I'm not I'm the same guy. The only thing that I do uh, for a living is compete that's not who i am i am i am me i'm i'm phil's and jean pierre's brother i'm madame tedio's uh, son i'm jean's you know uh, friend and i'm uh, the father and so on and so forth and so it was an it was a, a an interesting uh, experience to separate the ice man from the man yeah, I, and I, I I, really, i'm thinking yeah. i'm thinking that there's probably that phenomenon probably is found in the uh, um, elite, if I may, uh, or, you know, people that may be in a very stressful situation, combat, uh, vet, uh, you know, the pilots, uh, surgeons that are, 
you know, playing with somebody's brain, uh, somebody that uh, really is on edge all the time, performing their job, I'm thinking that uh, that's probably a mindset. Yeah. I, I hear that. Um, Sensei no fan, I see, I saw you really nodding along there when he mentioned being unassuming until you have to do the thing. Um, you want to get into that at all? Well, it just, it's, uh, I don't know. It's probably just my perspective, Sean. When, when I walk in, I, I see all the capabilities. Um, but I also see what the champ is saying. Like when you, I can see actually both sides of what he's saying. He's such a wonderful person from the moment that you meet him. He's so welcoming, very genuine. Um, but the other side of it is like, I would be uh, stricken with utter terror if I had to actually face him um, in conflict. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting, if I, if I may, uh, Randy, it's interesting that you say that um, because, you know, some people met me at the gym and met me here and there and, and uh, they want to, can I do a round with you just to take pictures and stuff like that and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> well, we're not, not talking about real rounds here. We're just talking about pictures. <laughs> yeah. But what they say, and everybody comes out with the same uh, sort of uh, statement at the end, is that when you stepped into the ring, I got scared. Because me, outside of the ring, is who, you, who you're talking with. When I step into the ring, this for me, this is a sacred place. Mm. This was always, always business. Don't mess around in here because people will get hurt, can get and will get hurt. And it's, you know, more complicated than just getting hurt. Um, <laughs> and th this part, I, I'm, I regret if I can use the term, I've uh, retired some fighters. Um, because they were completely um, overwhelmed by the defeat. Uh, maybe the spectacle of promoting the event before uh, and the statements that they've made uh, towards me about how they're going to, you know, take care of me, blah, blah, blah. And, and that is very, very, very stressful for any fighter. And all of a sudden, their world collapses. That to me is a, this has got to be a, a trauma that uh, it's hard to live with. It's, it's funny that you say that champ. When I watch, uh, when I think back to the many press conferences uh, that I saw, even the one with Rick Rufus where he tried to put ice on you and stuff like that. And uh, you just always remain so calm. And I just remember in every press conference thinking, holy fuck, you're going to find out. Like, you're doing yeah. this stuff to this man. Yeah. And he is not afraid of you one little bit. He's not <laughs> reacting to anything you're saying. Um, I'm planning. <laughs> I'm <laughs> right. <laughs> but, but, you know, you said, Champ, about uh, uh, your 61 knockouts. It, it's interesting. I, I asked this question once. Uh, um, I had an opportunity to train with Rashad Evans, the... Uh, uh, the late heavyweight champion from the UFC. And, right. you know, he once horrifically knocked out Chuck Liddell. I mean, it was a horrific knockout. One of the worst knockouts I've ever seen. And uh, I had a chance to ask him. We were alone in a restaurant. And I said to him, you know, champ, I'm curious to know what went through your mind when you, when you connected and you knocked out Chuck Liddell. And he said, well, you know, it's the hurt business, but you don't really want to hurt anybody. That's what he said. Yeah. Um, and he said, I looked over and at first he said, you know, you saw I was exhilarated. I started running around and he said that really changed to fear. Like as I looked over and saw Chuck Liddell laying there and medical staff coming in, I just wondered if you could speak to that. Uh, like you knocked out many more people than Rashad Evans, 61 people. What goes through your mind when that moment happens in the ring? Um. That's a that's an interesting question. I don't know that there's there's anything that goes through your mind. Same as when I step into the ring, when I perform uh, the task that I'm supposed to, and where the where the button is turned off after the fight, I, it's very difficult to say. I think what happens, uh, you know, if I'm looking at this, uh, is is when 
you know, the fight is announced, the, the win is announced, blah, blah, blah. And the fight fans are starting to come around the ring. That's where, you know, the Iceman has to disappear. Mm. Has to disappear because these people are there to either get an autograph or a picture or just say hi or that was a great fight or whatever. The human side of it, it becomes uh, that much more evident. And, uh, you know, there, there was one time I think I was fighting in um, Quebec City. And I hit the gentleman with a roundhouse kick on the chin and he fell and he, uh, his bodily functions let go. That was a very, very scary, very scary uh, moment. Uh, as you well know, when uh, uh, death happens, uh, that's what happened, that's what can happen. And so my trainer around, uh, around me was really very, very, very scared. And, and uh, the doctor had uh, difficulty sort of composing himself. And it was a very scary moment. Uh, other than that, I have to tell you honestly, uh, when the opponents uh, are revived, um, there's a sense of relief. Mm. Absolutely. I mean, I, we don't go in there with the intention of hurting, but I know that I'll hurt somebody because I train to hit hard. I train to hit with, with accuracy. I train to, to hit at, uh, very vital points, the liver, uh, the solar plexus, the temple. Um, um, and I know that there will be some reactions, some physical reactions from there. Uh, whether they go down or not, they will react somehow. I, I, will, I will hear a grunt. I will see it, you know, the body uh, sort of shrivel if it's a body punch. Um, there, are, there are, you know, physical reactions when somebody gets hit really really hard and it's a giveaway and so you know I'm a, I'm a good finisher because i recognize those signs so this this is a real good spot for me uh if you don't mind me jumping in here with uh you know uh, one of our black belts alden uh has asked a question here was the violence uh fighting aspect something that was innate in you um or was it something you had to acclimatize to that level of it and do you think that uh you know, martial arts in general has enough of that today or too much or not enough? Well, the, the nature of this sport is a violent one. Uh, I, and I, when I say that, I don't mean that this is a violent sport. To me, a sport is a sport. You know, you're, you're skating at 40 miles an hour and hitting a puck at 100 miles an hour or baseball or whatever. whatever. The nature of it is a, it's, it's an acceleration. It's, mm. you know, mass. It's, it's a mass acceleration that can hurt. Um, and so in that sense, it, it's, a, it's a very sort of violent uh, um, application. I, you know, uh, I probably, I prefer, have, you know, saying my competitive uh, juices. I, I, when I do something, whether it's, you know, kickboxing or, you know, hockey or running or whatever it is, I want to give everything that I have because I'm competing uh, obviously with somebody else or against the time, against the clock. When I'm running, uh, when I was running, I'm preparing for fights. I would run um, a certain amount of time, a certain amount of, uh, a certain distance, but I had to do it in a certain amount of time. I did uh, sprints, 200, 200 yard sprints. And uh, when I first started doing these things, I would do a certain time in my first one and my second one and then my third one, my fourth one started to slow down a little bit and fourth and fifth, I would do 12. And by the 12th, I was significantly low, uh, slower than the first one. When I was in my peak, in the middle 30s, in the, in the mid 30s, my, set, my last one was just as fast as my first one. And that, those are things that, you know, that, that sort of violence, if you want to call it, my competitive yeah nature i needed to do some i you know i, I didn't set out to be a, a professional kickboxing champion I, I set out to be a professional athlete i want to be an athlete it could have been baseball it could have been hockey it could have been anything else it just so happened to be martial arts so yes and so here's, here's a fun fact sean is uh the champ would run we all like since you know we've all run he would run four to six miles at under a six minute a mile pace. Right. Right. So 
if you think you're a good athlete, go out and try and do that and see how you feel at the end of two or three miles, let alone uh -huh. six miles, under yeah. six minutes every mile. Yeah. So would it be fair good to luck. say that you're approaching these as like tasks? Like if I, I just have to accomplish these tasks that happen to have an explosive nature, but you're not thinking about this violently. You're thinking about this as tasks. I'm going to do this. Yeah. That's going to condition me. And then I'm going to go in the ring and do it again. Absolutely. I would... Um you know, dissect a particular movement from the ground up. And, and every uh, phase of it has, had to be comfortable uh, to, the, to the extent that I would continue with the motion. Uh, if there's a part of it that didn't feel right, I had to stay there and make it right in order for me to complete the punch or the kick or what have you. So I, I had a lot of dead time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I spend a lot of time dissecting stuff. Um, and, you know, I, I mentioned the sports psychology. I would work, at, you know, physically I would work the movement, but I would also see myself see, uh, executing the movement so that if, if I'm, you know, doing shadow boxing in the mirror, I look at it, there's a visual feedback, and then I go away from the mirror and I have to feel the exact same way that I was feeling when I looked at the mirror and I saw this is the perfect way to throw the punch. I step away from the mirror and I have to feel this is the perfect way to throw the punch so that uh, that would uh, certainly resonate or, 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 or I was able to duplicate that when I would step into the ring. So I would look at uh, the execution of the punch itself, the, the result, I didn't really give a shit. Uh, it so happens that if I execute it properly, everything falls into place, uh, there will be a reaction. Whether it finish with whether it finishes the fight or not, there will be a reaction. So uh, sometimes it's just I, I fought Dan Macaru, so he was light heavyweight champion of the world, never been knocked down, on, and uh, tough guy, really a really 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 nice guy. And I knocked him down in the first round, and uh, it was uh, a minute and fifty five, I think, and he got up and he was completely, you know, in his own mind. I'm sure in another city. Uh, but the bell saved him and he came back and he fought like that for 10 rounds. I knocked him down five times and broke it, broke his jaw, cut up his face. I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was awful. And, uh, um, but there were, you know, there's never any intention on hitting. It's just, there's a, you have to execute the movement. You have to execute the punch or the kick or the defensive movement, uh, as good as you can possibly do it. And, uh, funny thing about that is, <laughs> Danny Macaruso's tongue was about two inches thick. He, he, I, I just cut him up. And uh, he came to me after the fight. He said, you know, Chap, after me, you're the toughest guy I ever met. Hey, Champ, let me ask you, you know, um, over the years, I've watched a lot of kickboxing. Um, when I watch you, when I watch the videos of you fighting, uh, I want to connect this to what you were just talking about. Mm. Uh, 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 you, 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 you fight a very technical, a very sound technical game, right? The elbows and knees are in the place they're supposed to be. The hips are turning the way they are. The, I haven't, I hadn't seen that in a lot of kickboxers. You know, my impression of generally speaking of a lot of kickboxers, not that you didn't fight some great guys, but um, you know, sort of the average amateur kickboxer doesn't seem to work on fundamentals very much. Um, right. Uh, when did that become important to you? Like, what was, what was, it sounds like you addressed that, but what, do you have some thoughts on that? Um, when it became apparent is when I uh, was lucky enough to bump into my trainer. Uh, he was of this, of like mind that he, you have to do these things right. And uh, from there on, I mean, my trainer, Guy, was a, was a boxer, a uh, reasonably good boxer, Canadian champion in the amateurs, in the fundamentals, and we would work on the fundamentals all the time. Um, as far as the hands were concerned, the punches or the kicks was really left up to me. I mean, I don't want to diminish, uh, you know, the, the trainers and the, the, the senseis at Terrier Jiu-Jitsu uh, Dojo at the time. They were all very good, obviously, uh, uh, Hanchi Terrier, and there was a bunch of others that were good. And they showed me how to kick, and I worked on them myself. Uh, with Guy, obviously, I, I, I gave him... Uh, um, but so I validated his presence by listening to him. He's, he's got something to say. And I just took it, you know, very seriously. I mean, what he's saying and, 
I fought uh, 12 fights maybe without throwing a hook punch because I wasn't comfortable with it. And I worked on it and worked on it and, and Guy worked on it. And, uh, and uh, it, just say, it just came to be natural. I have a, Guy had another, um, I had another trainer, uh, Guy's assistant, Mark. And Mark, uh, Mark knew how to range me or pull me back into off my, if I were, if I was off of my direction or my, my, my line, he would pull me in by asking very subtle questions to me. And I, at the beginning, I didn't really click on it, but what he did was, we're talking about that hook punch. He said, hey champ, can you show me that hook punch again? And what he was telling me was that we have to correct the, the hook punch. I thought that was an amazing uh, way of doing it. Certainly in my case, uh, I, I don't know that I'm, um, you know, rum, um, you know, uh, uh, obstinate enough to just not listen to anybody. So I can do this on my own, or I got it, I got it, I got it. Uh, but I, when I when I realized what he was doing, I oh man, I, this guy's invaluable. For me, he's invaluable. Maybe somebody else would be different, but for me, it was just <clears throat> invaluable. Yeah. I'll tell you one thing. Thurman regretted that you learned how to throw hooking punches. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but we fought twice. Uh, yeah. It's a good boy. I saw him on, uh, with a couple of pictures on Facebook just the other day, and I think he's uh, uh, transitioned into a pretty successful businessman. That's good to hear. Yeah, absolutely. I always like to hear that guys are doing well for themselves and uh, uh, evidently some some are doing better than others. Um, mm. But it's always nice to know that, uh, you know, the we have a career and it, uh, this is a career for young for young men, generally speaking. And a successful career like mine um, has an end point as far as the competitor is concerned. But I was, I was uh, certainly around here in, in, in Canada um, in the media a lot. And um, I came to understand that my career is not over now because I was given a platform to do something for my community. Mm. And because I did have notoriety in the past as a fighter, uh, if I called the uh, you know the the, the local uh, uh, newspaper or, or or TV whatever they would they would uh, listen to me because I was somebody at one point, and so the the fact is that a career like mine never finishes. If you don't realize what you can do with the tool that you were giving, which was fame or whatever you want to call it, to do something for the community, you're missing the boat entirely. So. <coughs> the career never runs really. So that brings us to a question that comes in from Carl Preslin. Um, what were your thoughts uh, when kickboxing was banned in Ontario after you shared all that information with the commission? Hey, Carl, nice to see you. Nice to hear from you. Uh, yeah, it was a bit. I went on holidays. I went on holidays uh, with my children's mother at the time uh, to Mexico. And I came back and the sport had been banned. I thought, well, <laughs> wow, that's interesting. What am I, uh, you know, what, where am I going to, to ply my, my sport? Yeah. Um, as a result of one of my fights, I fought in Toronto and I knocked uh, Steve Mackey, I knocked him out with a kick. And evidently the, the, a couple of weeks later, uh, the, the government and in its infinite wisdom decided this is too violent and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, uh, it, it banned uh, pending a 90 day moratorium, which lasted uh, three years. Uh, the flip side of that is that I was able to cross the river here because I'm in Ottawa yeah. and I crossed the river. I'm in Quebec. And so I fought in Quebec. And that was a that was a, a very sort of successful transition because um, even though I'm Acadian, I come from New Brunswick, I fought in Montreal and all of a sudden I'm in, I'm in Montreal. Or so they, they adapted me. Uh, they adopted me really, really quick. And, uh, you know, I had a very successful career in, uh, in Quebec. 
So this actually leads uh, right right to another question, actually, quite perfectly, uh, from Virginie Carrier. I don't know if you're French or Virginie Absolutely. Carrier. Virginie is one of my students. Good, nice to, to hear uh, Virginie. Merci. Wonderful. Um, so one of the things uh, she asked, and, and this is a great segue, you talked about not being able to apply your trade. I know in Toronto, there's some small gyms and some jujitsu academies and things that are having trouble in karate because of the COVID. So her question is, in your life and in the kickboxing world, you've most certainly been through rough times. In difficult times, and this current pandemic certainly qualifies as one, what would your advice be to help people navigate the rough times? Oh boy, that's a that's a difficult time because, uh, or a difficult question because uh, I think we all live, uh, you know, different circumstances. We, uh, <coughs> excuse me, my gym is still open. Mm -hmm. uh, we're following the uh, recommendations that the government imposed on us, government that I didn't vote for. Um, you have to know where you're going. You have to know what's going on, and you have to be aware. Of, of what is going on and uh, um, and if I'll take for example Northern Karate in Toronto great martial art uh, family uh, they immediately turn into you know a, a, a sort of a very negative um, phenomenon this COVID thing and turned it into a positive because they start doing uh, Zoom and they're very successful with it and uh, you know at the beginning I thought I, I sense that everybody was sort of spinning their wheels and so, okay, what's going to, what's going to happen? And uh, we can't stay closed for more than so on and so forth and da, da, da. And, uh, uh, and I think they set the bar, they set the, the pace for a lot of different schools. And mm -hmm. uh, um, you just have to know what you can do in, in this particular time and uh, what you can do. And uh, not be afraid to ask or explore if there are areas or if there are uh, uh, you know there's people that can help you just ask ask questions ask help there's no shame in asking for help merci virginie c'est bien ça me fait plaisir de t'entendre je te vois pas but merci pour la question um, and then that segues nicely to a question from uh, one of our club members justin shay uh, from the very few losses you had, what were some of the important lessons you took away from those for yourself? Well, uh, lo losses uh, do come with, with a lesson. Uh, sometimes uh, those lessons uh, appear when you're ready to listen to it. <laughs> sometimes you just don't want to hear. Uh, there are a couple of losses that I think I could have avoided had I not taken the fight, not because of the opponent, but because of me and my preparation. Mm. Um, they, you know, my second fight, I lost against a, an amazingly good fighter out of the Rick Jocelyn team. And by the way, uh, Rick uh, uh, promoted a couple of my fights early on, and I do, uh, I'm very appreciative and very thankful for that. And he had some amazing fighters. Uh, uh, Lambie in the core fields and Murray Sutherland. Murray Sutherland uh, kicked the shit out of me. My second fight, that fight I never should have taken because Murray was a very accomplished boxer at the time who eventually became world boxing champion. And so he had a couple of fights more than I did and uh, uh, he cut me over my left eye and the fight was, was, uh, was done. Uh, but I'm happy that I got cut and not knocked out because he he would have knocked me out cold. And that could have been, you know, seriously, and we talked about this earlier on, that uh, a knockout like that can have devastating effects on, on somebody. If you're starting a, a career and bang, you, you know, take a knockout or, or something of that nature, it could make you decide, no, I'm not going in that direction at all. And so my, my life would have taken a complete different direction. So uh, I'm very thankful that he uh, didn't knock me out. He tried. <laughs> so if you yes that's it okay it's a random question it's kind of out of the blue uh i'd be curious champ to hear your thoughts for people you fought in the ring a lot but i know when you were a teenager in vanier and you were a yellow belt you were once accosted by th three people 
what do you see the difference between that when you were accosted by those three people and the result and what happens in the ring? Um, yeah, I remember that incident. Uh, <clears throat> what happened immediately after I had to defend myself, yeah, I, I got to tell you, I was scared. I was scared shitless and uh, I just sort of balled up my, 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 my hand and threw a punch and, you know, the face exploded and blood and teeth and stuff like that. And I immediately got really scared, really, really scared. It doesn't happen in an actual fight where there are rules and boxing gloves and an opponent that accepted, you know, the, the <coughs> accepted to uh, participate in the, the actual fight. So if you hit somebody in the, in the ring, it's like, okay, I, I, my intention was to hit him hard and, and, and hit him uh, precisely. And if, if he falls down, great. If he doesn't, I'll hit him again. Whereas, uh, something in the street like that, it's completely an emotional reaction. And uh, <clears throat> as a professional fighter, you cannot afford to be emotionally involved in your fight. And so I got very, very, very scared and ran away, essentially, and uh, never happened to me again. I never struck a person out of anger, uh, um, out of fear. I, I never struck anybody outside of the ring. That's, so, I, that's really nice to hear. Okay, yeah, on a it, different... It's useless. It's, I mean, it's useless. It's an emotional reaction. Uh, some, obviously, if you have to defend yourself, fine. But if you're instigating, I think, uh, you you know, just sets a different... It, it sets a, a, a mindset that uh, is not healthy at all. Can I ask you... Uh, do you remember the first time you saw Anchitarian? And what it was like the first time you saw him and maybe if the second question would be could you speak about your bnb &B agreement with hanshitarian <laughs> yeah well we'll get to that second one the bnb &B agreement is uh after I've, you know i've been with john 48 years uh we'll go to the first part i walked up the stairs and this there this there this uh, you know five foot eight uh, he's starting to, he's starting to ball, you know, go bald a little bit. Uh, <laughs> he's wearing this kind of funny pajama. I don't know anything about martial arts at the time. I went with my brother because, uh, you know, I, I, I guess at 17, 18 years old, you see fight in the, the schoolyard. And in my case, I, I, I look at these fights and I always wonder, and I'm wondering maybe other young men do the same thing, but what would I do? What would I do in that in that situation? And my 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 sort of first reaction was, I'd run away because I would you know I was a scared I was a scared uh, 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 young teenager didn't know anything about martial arts didn't know anything about fighting, and so uh, <coughs> and so uh, um, I went I went there with my brother and my friend just to see what it's about jujitsu what's jujitsu you know back then it was just karate 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 we'll do something different we'll go and see and maybe do jujitsu and the but the first thing he did was he was very uh, uh, accommodating and uh, extended his hand and welcome to my club and uh, what can i do for you and blah, blah, blah. And <coughs> we uh, i was 18 at the time so i was able to uh, register and sign a legal contract and my brother wasn't, and so he went back and uh, I got my mom's approval. And um, um, you know, the rest is history. I mean, there's so much history. There's so much. Uh, you know, from that moment on, I understood that uh, this is a, a very caring man, um, and he cares about the students that that he uh, he has on his floor. And, uh, you know, at the end of the class, he would ask for volunteers to help uh, clean the dojo and stuff. And I would always bring my hand up because I just really enjoyed helping him because mm. he helped me. He showed me something today that, who knows, may help me defend myself or what have you. But uh, he was a giving man. So I thought, well, well, you know, quid pro quo. You give, I give. You give, I give. It was always like that with John and I. It was always, always like that. He gave me the, uh, and John's, uh, 
And, you know, forgive me, I don't mean disrespect when I say John rather than Hanshi, but we're friends. Uh, John and I are friends and, uh, uh, you know, proper setting is Hanshi, probably the proper setting here, but I'm so used to calling him John. I just love the guy. Um, he's been all over the world and he's, he's uh, influenced and, and uh, effect, you know, had a positive effect on a lot of people, a lot of people. And so... Uh, and we had a, we had a bit of an understanding of each other. It's like when it's your turn, I'm gonna I'm gonna cheer you on, and when it's my turn, you're gonna cheer me on. And it's it was always mm. reciprocal. I mean, it, it, it's champ. It's your time to have the spotlight. He would back away, even though people knew him and he sort of congregated around him, and he wanted to talk to him, and he would give him the spotlight. And obviously, the same thing. I mean. Uh, uh, so it's, it's very respectful, very mutually respectful and loving relationship. I just love the guy. I mean, uh, you know, he's been uh, more than just a trainer for me. I mean, he, uh, you know, in, in hard times uh, and good times, um, we're just very, it seems to me that we, we knew each other before we were even born. I mean, it was, you know, sometimes uh, we would uh, do an event together and, uh, He'd be on the other side of the ra on the other side of the room, and I'd look at him, and we understood this is where we have to go. This is what we have to do. I'm sure that the uh, master Lagasse has uh, students like that. You just have to look at them, and you know, and uh, they know what you need to. And and so uh, th those kind of relationships are priceless. Man. I mean, just uh, I can't say anything uh, enough about uh, Mr. Terry. He's just one of these guys, man. He's, just, he's my friend. Yeah, I like that, uh, Champ. Definitely. I like to tell my students that if my back is to Hanshi Legacy, if I'm standing in the dojo and my back is to Hanshi Legacy and he looks at me, I can feel his gaze and know what he wants me to do. <laughs> that's a great, that, that's a great that relationship. I mean, that's an amazing relationship, really. But, but that, you that, that's, I think that's a testimony to, to uh, the person that, the people that we are. <clears throat> you know, and, and, and certainly uh, uh, Master Lagasse um, and John Terry and, and, and Cesar Bukowski and Alexei and all these people, I mean, they're very influential martial artists in the world. Uh, but we have a, when you, and they know there's thousands and thousands and thousands of, and when you have a particular connection with a guy like that, then there's, you know, it's priceless really. And good for you, man. I mean, I'm happy to hear that, uh, uh, Randy, that you have a connection with Master Legacy because uh, those are rare moments, really. Yeah, it, with uh, Hanchi Legacy and Sensusfino, I can tell as I start to put my hand on the sword if I'm doing it correctly or not. <laughs> <laughs> you have any bad days? <laughs> uh, you didn't speak though, champ. You didn't speak to the B and B uh, agreement that you had oh, with Hanshi. Of, of course, we could sort of understood that. One point is like we did an interview, and John said to the journalist, "He said, you know, imagine if I had to fight and he had to promote." He talked about <laughs> me. And this guy. John, if, I, if I'm the if I'm the manager, John, you'll never fight again in your life. <laughs> I have no ability to promote to manage anybody but uh, the uh, that's when he came out with the bnb &B agreement he books them and i beat them mm. <laughs> <laughs> <What is that? laughs> sensei i, I want to chip in on something here you know um one of my favorite things about the comments when i'm watching your fights is how many people are like that guy was like a fucking yellow belt during this fighter that guy wasn't even a black belt during this like um yeah. so this the question is very simple yeah. Why were you so good? I mean, you came through the martial arts classically, but in a very short time with what could be arguably low ranks, you're getting into the ring. But when you speak about it, you're speaking about it the way my classical sensei speak about it. Don't worry about hitting, just worry about the technique, yeah. executing properly, the hit will come. How did you get so good? And how did you get down that classical thinking, I'd call it, while being in the sports competitive realm? A lot of people don't have both. Um, geez, I, I think that the, the competitive side that I, we talked about earlier, I want to do things and do them right. Whether I was in school, whether I was, you know, 
playing sports or helping around the house or interacting with my friends. I just want to do it right. And uh, yeah, it was innate. It was it was there. It was you know to use a very um, common cliche. It was a God given uh, gift, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then that's what kept that thinking going over the years. Like, well, that, oh, I'm going to go do yeah. this. Yeah, that's what drove me in the direction that I did. We talked about the focus and talked about the commitment. We talked about the, you know, self-criticism about, uh, you know, all the verbalization and visualization and all these things that have a, a place in, uh, in, you know, has a spoke in that wheel and just makes it go forward. And, um, you know, John and I look at each other and the, <clears throat> well, we did. We do promotions. Obviously, our biggest promotion is Capital Conquest in November. Mm -hmm. This year, it will, be, it will not be. And uh, you know, we promote uh, six or seven within that particular weekend. We promote six or seven independent from each other events. Right. And uh, it's a crazy, crazy weekend, and there are uh, obstacles that will present themselves and both John and I have the same ability if I may uh, to not see the the obstacle but beyond that and what is it that we have to do in order to get that thing out of the way we don't look at the problem we do we immediately seize on the solution and so uh, that, that that was something a mindset that I guess I had when I was fighting when I was this this is I was talking to you about, you know, dissecting a particular movement <clears throat> and coming to a point, coming to a phase in that movement where it didn't really click for me. Um, I would work on it, work on it, work on it until uh, I was able Like we lost him. Uh, might have to um, bring your audio back. That's it. Okay, Sensei. there it is. Yeah. Sorry, I, the screen went out. Sorry about that. Great. You're just talking about so, dissecting yeah. a move when it was. That's where we lost you. Exactly. I, I, so, just, say I, I just, I just peed myself a little bit. Like when the screen went blank, I was like, <laughs> "Oh, my God, what just happened here?" <laughs> oh, thank you so much for coming back. I was like, "How can this?" Happen? <laughs> Part of these questions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so like I was saying, it's it's a it's a matter of, uh, um, you know, f looking at the solution rather than anything else. And uh, and uh, that was uh, even as a kid. I mean, if, even as a kid, is that there's a problem here? No, there's no problem. There's a solution right next to it. Look, with you know, don't have to look with your eyes to see. Um. And at one point there, you're talking about the capital conquest and bringing together these different, uh, these disparate arts and this kind of thing. And that actually goes to the, the other question Virginie had, which is, Johnny, if you were and still are a leader in your field, uh, what is your advice to leaders out there? What, what, what helps people lead? Recognize your, your place. I mean, if you're, if you're going to take us, if you're going to take that position, you have to understand that the people will look at you. Uh, in, in, and, and have questions for you. You better know what you're doing. And so, uh, you know, there are certain areas, there are certain events where even though I may be a leader in my field uh, and I do promote and, and so on and so forth and lead classes and run a gym, there are, or there are times where this is not my place. There are other people that may not be, you know, high-ranking martial artists and maybe, you know, businessmen or, or, or what have you. These are people that should be leading uh, this conversation or should be leading this project. So you have to understand what your position is and accept it. Like I, I was referring to that uh, <clears throat> earlier on. When John is in the spotlight, I cheer for him. And then when I'm in the spotlight, he cheers for me. And uh, just recognize your position. And, uh, you know, there, there, there's a lot of... There's a lot of pretenders, I suppose, uh, um, in all walks of life, um, and they're soon they're soon to be found out. So, you put pressure on yourself. You might as well uh, expect uh, a, a shitstorm at one point for sure.
Mm. Um, Sensei Suino, you know, we, we, we've talked about the psychological aspect with uh, Sensei Terio and also um, the, the, the leadership idea. I know that's stuff that, that you touch on outside of even your martial arts work. Is, is there anything you want to go to there? Well, Champ, I was just, I was interested to ask you, uh, you're talking about sports psychology. When you had to, when you had to go to, to Quebec or when you had to uh, uh, go to a brand new venue, um, uh, something unfamiliar, what was that like? Did you do anything special to prepare yourself for it? Um, did you experience more fear before the fights? What was, you know, what was the experience of getting ready to step into a different stage? Yeah, yeah that, I like that question. Uh, you know, you were comfortable in the familiar. Uh, I train, I, you know, I would travel around the world and I would oftentimes have to be there a couple of weeks before for promotional uh, responsibilities, I suppose. And uh, <clears throat> the fact of the matter is um, I'm going to a different gym, but it's a gym. Mm -hmm. uh, we will find some sparring partners. That's my, my coach's job. Uh, we'll be in a restaurant or for, for our meals. We'll be in a hotel for, you know, to sleep. Uh, but the mindset is just go over the familiar. What is familiar to you? I wake up at a certain time. Uh, we go to, I go for my run. Uh, we have breakfast. We go for the, the workout in the afternoon. We do the, the, uh, the uh, promotional stuff uh, at night or in the afternoon, go and meet the, the, the sponsors and so on and so forth. But my focus is on the fight. I, I'm, you know, it doesn't matter if I'm, you know, two or three weeks in the, uh, you know, a glorious city like Paris. Paris doesn't exist when I'm there for mm. a workout or for, for a fight. Uh, so, so you know, the focus, like this is something that I trained forever and ever since I was, a, you know, a young kickboxer is that I have to train my mind to accept what I'm going to do. I'm going to be working out for an hour and a half in a very, you know, the, the application is a very violent one. I go fast, I hit hard. Uh, and, and I'm not, and like I said, the, you know, violent, I'm not talking about hitting somebody. I'm talking about the application. Um, mm -hmm. And this is what I have to do. I have to keep myself focused. Uh, my my father-in-law, one, uh, one fight, uh, my father-in-law, who uh, was a fan of mine, uh, came to the fight, was very excited and was hanging out with my coach and my, you know, my, uh, my, my, uh, my manager uh, in the, the evening before the fight, and he was just, he was just in heaven. He's just having a great time. And so, okay, I'm going to build up the, well, uh, the poor man died uh, in his sleep. And uh, that was, a, you know, 20 hours before a fight. And I liked the guy. And so uh, we did what we had to do in order to, and my then wife was with me and we, uh, we had to make sure that to uh, take care of her. Um, but my focus was still on that fight. I mean, uh, you know, it's almost uh, anybody looking at me within those particular circumstances would have said you're, you're inhuman and you're cruel uh, because of my behavior. Uh, I understood that at this particular time, um, I have to make sure that she is well taken care of. And this is where my, my best friend comes in, Mr. Terry. And he arranged to have her uh, go back home, blah, 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 blah. And I fought that same night. And after the, the knockout punch, I collapsed. Uh, you know, repressing or, or just keeping everything inside focus, 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 focus. And the reality of it is there's a man that just died, man. And it's like, boom, boom, boom. I, I fought and uh, my trainer was there, Mark, and he caught me because I was, I was, I, I collapsed. And so uh, those are instances that uh, I look back on and say, you son of a bitch. I mean, to be, that's not even close to being human being, but I'm not a human being. I'm the, I'm, I'm the fighter. This is where, this is where you sort of disconnect, uh, you know, Jair, the boy, the son, the father, mother, whatever, and the Iceman completely disconnect from one from the other. And uh, 
I knew that there was something that I had to do in order to do. It's like six, 7,000 people there. Uh, Got to go, folks. Difficult to, you know, even saying something like this is stupid. But th those are the realities of the uh, you know, professional fighting. As inhuman as you say that was, would you do it the same way again? Um, you know, I try to avoid having regrets. Uh, this is one that uh, is, is sort of hard to shake. There are a few, there are a few regrets. Uh, I, I, I don't know that I would do anything different. Um, evidently after the fight and I went back home and we had the, you know, the whole process and I obviously took her in my arms and got that done. Um, the, but, and, the, and I'm hoping, I'm hoping, so I never got any you know, backlash from it. I'm hoping that they accepted the fact that the, this is what had to be done. Mm -hmm. And uh, Roger, my, my, my father-in-law was completely uh, in a blissful place when he was with us and you had you know, it, one of the strangest things, man, I'm, I'm thinking of it now, the strangest thing is that he was sitting with us and he was having a good time and laughing. He said, you know, man, I could die tonight and go to heaven. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> you yeah. Oh, come on. You know, oh, shit, eh? Mm -hmm. I don't think you went to heaven, though. <laughs> yeah, you had to stop over somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, he had to work some shit out. <laughs> um, so you know, a fighter of your caliber, um, I, I don't get the chance to talk to a lot. So can I just ask you a bit? And we are a hint tight for time, but we'll talk as long as you want. What does a camp look like? Like when you talked about taking those fights that you wouldn't have, not because the opponent, but because of the time. You know, if when you have your ideal camp, what does that look like? Um, six to eight weeks, but you got to set a, you know, set it straight here. I, when I first started fighting, I was at 21, I probably, I think, and I stopped, I was 40, close to 41. And since the, the moment that I stopped, that I started fighting, I didn't stop. Mm. I went 20 years without stopping. I stopped one time. I was, I stopped because I broke my hand. But after the, they put the cast on, I was in the gym the following day. So I stopped fighting for the, the six or seven months, but I didn't stop working out because I, in my mind, I have, I have stuff to do. I have to tweak this. I have to arrange it. I have to, I have to find out why is this happening? You know, that mind is always, always, always going. And so, um, you know, training, training to me was sacred. Um, so six to eight weeks, um once we get the word once the uh you know the particulars are all taken care of the negotiations are taken care of um i take about i took about uh, a week and a half to two weeks to because i was always in shape my resting heart rate was 36 put it that way <laughs> um so i would take a, a week and a half to two weeks to sort of get in get in my speed get in my rhythm and for the six weeks, I would build on it. I would build on it. For two weeks, I would be working on specific. And then the next, uh, you know, two weeks later, I would up it a couple of degrees. Uh, and two weeks later, again, I would up it a percentage so that uh, about a, 10 days to a week to 10 days out uh, away from the fight, I would peak. I was peaking. Um, I always argued that I, I peaked for about 20 years as an athlete because I never stopped working out, but that one was specific. I need to peak uh, and keep that peak for a few days until I fight and then take a day or two off and then go back to the gym. Um, and so it was progressive. It was, it was uh, um, you know, scientific, if I may uh, use that, I, I would, I would uh, you know, calculate the, uh, um, <clears throat> the time that I took to run, um, if, if I wasn't meeting my numbers after a couple of weeks, uh, something I had to, I had to adjust. Um, I would uh, uh, count the amount of round every day. Every day I categorize how many rounds that I do. I did, you know, five rounds of footwork and five rounds of this and five rounds of that and three rounds of this. And, 
and I would go over and a bit methodically going every over every aspect of the fight game itself. And uh, <clears throat> and there's one thing that I also understood is, is that when I'm without my gym, my equipment, my 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 comfort zone, when I'm without, I train within. Mm. I would train my mind. I would be training my mind all the time. I would, mm. you know, this is something that made the uh, you know uh, family life a little bit harder because sometimes my i was uh, i was still in my space you know and I, I, after an hour or two i would sort of disconnect but an hour or two after you're home it's too late when you have children it's too late man you have to disconnect when you step out of the gym you have to disconnect right there and then i learned to do that but uh, there are times this uh, you bring it home you know um, Sensei Dolphin. This is a less serious topic, but one that I'm curious about, and I think it's a question you might not have been asked before. I was always curious to know about JT Will, who refereed so many of your fights. What was it like when he came into the change room before you fought? What kind of a person did you see him to be was he a nice man in your opinion how he, was he, he yeah he was i like jt he was uh he was the only referee that i was scared of um he uh he was a funny man as well he but he never came into the ring or into this the dressing room uh, there was always a delegate that would come and explain the rules and that would oftentimes be uh from the commission they would come in i mean the commission and their their pretension contentious is a you know it's annoying sometimes and uh, they have to sort of validate themselves but uh, they have a job to do and uh, um, they would do it but uh, when I you know stepped into the ring and was JT I understood uh, I gotta be I gotta be clean mm. uh, I gotta you know do my work and let him do his work there are other co there are other maybe other referees that I probably did not have the same respect for, but that really doesn't matter because uh, I'm a rules guy. So if they say, if they say stop, I stop. Uh, but what I feel inside is another story. But JT Will, if he said stop, he didn't say stop, he barked it. And so that's what made me scared. You know, my opponent got scared as well, so we stopped. Uh, he, was, he was a fun guy. I went to dinner with him one time after a fight and uh, we're in Montreal in a nice uh, Japanese restaurant and he opens the, the menu and he says to, to the waitress, uh, when she asks, what will you have, sir? She, well, I'll have the left side. So he, <laughs> he ordered everything on the left side. <laughs> He's a big guy. <laughs> um, Sensei, we asked our uh, all of our guests the 10 questions. So, uh, you know, just pop out with your answers. Um, you can think about them a lot, but sometimes the impulsive answers are best. What is the most effective move in your martial arts arsenal? Whichever lands, I guess. Who is the most influential martial artist in your life? Oh, no, no. I had a couple. I have a couple of heroes. Wally Sloak is one of them. Um, obviously, John Terry is one of them. Yeah. Caesar, I love Caesar as well. Caesar Bukowski, I love him. But there's a whole bunch of people. Go ahead. Um, who do you think is the most influential martial artist of all time and why? Oh, I read uh, the Tao of Jeet Kune Do when I was 18, Bruce Lee. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I thought, you know, at, at the time I thought, why does, and it just sort of made so much sense to me, why is it that people don't get this? It was, it was, it, it made so much sense and that's why it's, that's why I say my destiny was was already drawn. It was already uh, in in the in the books because I, it just sort of made sense. Things made sense that a lot of the fighters, the successful fighters, talk about nowadays. What excites you most about your next five years of training? I'm still in the martial arts. Mm. I'm going to meet some amazing people. I guarantee I'm going to make a you know the best is yet to come. Simple as that, man. <laughs> if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you get there? 
<laughs> Why'd you hit him so hard? <laughs> and they're all lined up behind him going, yeah, I want to know that too. <laughs> Um, I think you touched on this, but your favorite TV and film martial artist? Uh, that's a difficult one to answer. There's a, there's a lot of them that have an entertained... Uh, Sean, <laughs> how about you? I'll take it. I'll take it. Hey, I got my first shout out on Punch right. Cake Joke Chat. Um, who that you didn't get a chance to meet would you want to fight the most uh, now or in your prime? Um, I would have, I, I love watching, uh, Raymond Deckers. He was a, he was, he was a bad little mother. Uh, he's a, he's a Dutch fighter, very talented, very driven. Uh, he's a smaller guy, 135 pounds. Uh, but I certainly would have liked to, you know, rub shoulders with him. There's a, there's a bunch of people that I'd love to, uh, to meet if I could dead or alive. I would. Somebody asked me one time and they, they choked them up because I, it came up to me. So who would you like to meet if you had a chance? My father. Mm. I would love to meet my father and ask him, so what do you think? What do you think? Did I make you proud? What do you think he'd say? Yeah. All right. Um, if everyone in the world could have the benefit you've most gotten from martial arts, whether they train or not, what would it be? Uh, I think I, I was I was uh, given uh, a platform to to be able to do what I was ultimately put on this earth to do is to help others. I wanted to I wanted to be a gymnast, uh, 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 physical education teacher, or a cowboy, but that didn't pay too much. And so, uh, a physical education teacher. But as it turned out, I'm a phys physical education teacher. I wanted to be a teacher. I wanted to, I wanted to um, have the, 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 the opportunity to uh, enlighten somebody on something that they may need or they may want. And uh, that's, I tell you right now, that's the, the, the nicest thing that, uh, that, I, that I was giving in this life is the opportunity to help somebody, whether it's by my words or my actions or you know, correcting somebody, what have you. Uh, we do a lot, uh, we do, I say we, because I do have a lot of people that help me with this, but we do a, a lot of charitable events over the course of the year. And over a bunch of years, we've raised over half a million dollars for people who needed it. Uh, autism last year, uh, uh, you know, sexually assault, uh, aggressed uh, children, one foundation, which is you know, something that people don't really want to talk about because it's a taboo subject. Uh, we talked about, you know, we, we helped uh, cancer victims. We had the uh, heart and stroke. Uh, we did a whole lot of things. And if uh, people who do and uh, may have benefited from, you know, the immediate attention that I may have gotten over the course of the years, if they don't understand that this is, a, you know, the best possible tool that you'll, that you'll be given over the course of your whole life, uh, you know, the 20 years that I fought, this is a very, sort of a very self-serving. Mm. But the things that, I, that, I'm, that I'm able to give now, uh, I, I really hope and pray that everybody can get to that point where they say, you know, I have something that I can help somebody with. And the martial artist, the true martial artist, the one like Gary Legacy, the one like, like, uh, like uh, Cesar Vicalci, John Terry, and and some of the, you know, the very prominent martial artists. Uh, and these people that I just mentioned, they were all inducted into the, uh, into the Black Belt Hall of Fame. When I was inducted, my John was, uh, was asked about it. And he said, I'm so proud that uh, Jean Yves was indicted into the Martial Art Hall of Fame. Right. And John, it's not, that's, it's not the word. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, the, the, what I'm given and what I can do with it, that's probably the best gift that I can ever, you have to be aware of what, what's in front of you and, uh, and uh, uh, recognize those, either a lesson or a gift. And uh, I'm uh, still lucid enough to rec recognize what's going on and what I can do with it. 
Um, well, our last two questions, uh, and then I'm actually going to combine it with Hanshi Burkowski's question, which is in a similar vein. Um, greatest achievement, greatest regret, and if you could do anything over again, any unfinished business? Well, <clears throat> a couple of different areas. The greatest achievement, evidently people will, may point to the fact that I that I became champion of the world in spite of uh, being a very shy kind of, uh, or non-assuming kind of guy. Uh, that's an achievement. Um, but my, my biggest achievement in life is to have, um, I guided, I, I'm, I'm completely proud of the fact that I guided my children in the proper way. Mm. Um, they're amazing kids. Uh, I have two daughters and uh, um, they're really very, very nice uh, human beings. Um, I, w I certainly would have liked to uh, maybe travel a little bit more and fight in the, in the, the Middle East mm -hmm. to see how I, I would have fared. Uh, I don't have any regrets. It's just something that I may have liked to do. Uh, um, but again, you know what I said five minutes ago, the best is yet to come. I'm not finished. I'm not, I'm not by no means, and even if this COVID, uh, you know, affects us uh, negatively, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm a martial artist. I'm going to be a martial artist forever. Thanks, Sensei. So the way we like to wind this down is we go around the horn and we just sort of share our thoughts uh, about our time with you and then uh, we'll give you the last word. So Hanchi Legacy, is there anything you want to uh, throw out? Well, you know, I always said student is the best title and that's what all I did today was listen to the champ and, and all his answers. Very, very level-headed gentleman. Extremely great champion and uh, a neighbor of mine. From Absolutely. Not too far. We have to go uh, fishing one of these days, right? I would like that for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Go fishing and... Uh, Turn the trottle a little bit. We both have uh, Harley Davidsons, as does uh, Randy, and so we we'll have to get on the get on the the black tar and go somewhere. Uh, be expecting us, sir. That mm. boy, good stuff. <laughs> Salut, mon ami. Ça fait plaisir. Merci. Sensei Suino. Uh, champ, I just feel so lucky. Uh, you know, we talk with so many martial artists who've made it their life started somewhere, continued. And as you say, you, you have the gift of a platform, um, but what you do with that gift makes so much difference. And I'm just so grateful the last 10 minutes of this conversation, you've turned towards how you're helping the world. Mm. Um, I don't know what the magic is in, in martial arts, but people who stay in it their, for their whole lifetimes just seem to become really wonderful human beings. And uh, I'm, thank you for being here. I just, I'm, I feel really blessed. You're very kind. Thank you. Those are those very nice words. I. I do uh, share the same sentiment, uh, and I did mention some some names. Uh, these people have an immense uh, influence on me um, because of uh, who they are and what they contribute to this. To not only martial art industry, but this, but society. Um, and and it's it's uh, enti you're entirely right when you say that. The, I don't know if it's uh, you know wisdom that we acquire uh, or. I don't know, we come to a point where, and certainly, you know, in my case, that, 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 that very sort of self-serving career, I've come to a point where it's time for me to give now. Time to give, so, yeah. Sensei Dauphin. Champ, I write these notes, like, if, if it seems like I'm not paying attention, it's because I'm writing things down as we're talking. One thing that came through really clear is, the mind you talk so much about the mind um you know i have stuff to do i have work to do uh that's come through clear to me another thing i guess is just that the struggles in the beginning when you, you said you were in foster homes like many people would use that as a crutch to say oh this is why i did this or that and no you said Besides the emotional support, you had everything you needed. You see it very clearly. It wasn't actually a super bad time in your life. I'm gonna think about that. Um, one thing that makes me a little bit sad is that you say that you're alone in this world. 
a great champion like you, who the entire country loves you and many people in the world loves you. Um, if I could do anything for you, I would wish that I could make you not feel like you were alone. Um, the, your analogy to being on the edge all the time and a surgeon, I've never thought of that before. These, I've always thought of the pressure of a fighter and like you have to stand in there and make split decision uh, decisions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like there's lots of other areas in life where you have to make those split second decisions. Uh, so that's a lesson that I'm gonna take away. Um, I like that you said that you were scared in your, in your one street fight and it was emotional and that you've never ever hit anybody out of emotional outside of the ring ever again. That's great. I hope everybody aspires to that. Um, there's a solution to every problem. There's these other things. Training is sacred. <laughs> there, there's I really like but the, I, I, you were paying attention this sure. night. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, there, there, there's one thing that you, I think I have to, to, to address is that I, I came into this world alone and I will leave. When I die, I'm going to be, you know, exiting alone. But in the meantime, I've made some amazing friends. I don't feel lonely. I don't, you know, I, I'm, uh, I'm never lonely because I like my own company. Sometimes I tell jokes that I never heard before, and that's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, the fact that uh, what I what I meant by that is that um, I'm I'm a you know I'm I'm a, a ball of energy that comes into into uh, existence, and it'll. It'll continue in another realm at one point. I'll die and go somewhere else. Whatever happens after that, I don't know. But in between, in between that, um, <clears throat> I'm, a, I'm a son. And I'm a brother. And I'm a father. And I'm a husband. I'm a friend. I'm a coach. I'm a this, I'm a that. I'm a lot of things. Uh, so there, there's no time. There's not, there's no opportunity for or, or, or any reason for a guy like me to say that I'm alone. Um, what I meant with that is I came in, and what is it, Mr. Uh, is, uh, Chuck Merriman said the, the other day, he said, I came in bald with no teeth and I'm gonna go bald with no teeth. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so just a couple, I really appreciate that clarification, Champ. That makes me feel much happier inside. Um, I did like also that you said that you're really proud that you guided your children. Um, I think uh, since the Suino, since the legacy, I, I'm sorry, Sean, one day you'll get to feel that as well. Um, that's, a, that's a great thing. Um, again, training is sacred. I like when you said I have to train my mind to what I am about to do. A lot of people would say I have to train my body, but you said I have to train my mind for what I am about to do. Um, I, I love in the end when you said I'm a martial artist forever. We can all say that on this call. We're martial artists forever. That's something we all have in common. Um, and I really like that you said the best is yet to come. That's fucking awesome. That the best is yet to come. Yeah. And Sean, uh, I'm again, I said this at the beginning of the call and my final comment is going to be my feelings about my hero have only grown through this conversation. It's great to look at somebody on a TV and say, wow, I want to be that person. But it's a whole nother thing to get to meet them, listen to them, hear them and say, what I saw on the TV was great. But what I listened to and what I met is even better. Mm. So thanks, Champ, so much for being such Thank a great you. hero. You're very kind. Thank you. Um, yeah, actually, it's funny. I wrote down sacred place as well. You know, I really, really, really heard that the gym is a sacred place. And it just makes me so much more excited to go do my work. You know, and, 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 and everything you said about how you're in the ring at the highest level of this game ever just makes me more excited to go see my sensei Saturday morning because I'm like, oh, right, how I turn my hip, how I hold my elbow, how I focus my mind on the way. It's just, I'm just, I just, I'm so glad that I'm in that stream 
and that you could speak about it so clearly. And the last thing I want to say, Sensei, is, um, you know, you talk about yourself as shy and, and I know you're not lying or, but when, when I meet other shy people, they actually make a thing about it. And then it's really hard to talk to them. Uh, I think about it more as humble for you because you're so forthcoming. You're so clear. Uh, your, your stories are riveting and, and there's no end to how, how much I'd like to talk to you about this stuff, um, which is very different than how I think of a lot of shy people, which is annoying as fuck because how can I get it who they are if they won't, if they clam up and that's not you. And I really appreciate it because as a guy who talks for a living, it's really nice to have someone who can be a role model of, Oh, I'll, I'll be clear and I'll tell you what you need to know, but I might not need to fill up the space all the time. And when you said you have to know your role as a leader and know your place, I really heard that. And, and I hope I can move forward in my next week more humbly as well. Um, so the last words go to you. Well, thank you. It was a pleasure uh, talking to you all. Um, <clears throat> um, there, you know, there's, it, it's always a pleasure to sit down at, with martial artists and talk about, and I'd love to be able to sit with you guys and talk about your careers as well, because uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a reciprocal uh, uh, relationship that I'm that I'm uh, seeking, really. I mean, it's, it's just about me. It's just, uh, that's empty. Uh, relationships are not formed that way. And uh, I'm sure that at one point we're going to sit together and, and you know, have a, a, a beer or whatever and, and, and have fun. And I've met some of you guys before, uh, obviously, many times and know a few better than others. And, and forming relationship for me, like I said, I'll be... I came in alone. I'll be going alone, but in the meantime, there, there's ri there, there are ri richnesses that I seek. I seek. Uh, uh, I hate the 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 era of uh, the internet because the, there's a, a disconnect in, in humanity that I don't like. I, I have difficulty with that, and I, I like to connect with people. And you know, this this medium here is great. Um, because we can see each other, uh, we can almost sense an energy as well, and that, that, that's all. Um, so, uh, again, we're going to see each other at one point, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to sit down and enjoy each other's company and have some laughs and, uh, and uh, carry on. Thanks, Sensei. Um, sure. And normally, myself or Sensei Dofen does this, but Sensei Suino, do you want to tell everybody a little about Paul Martin, our guest for next week? Next week, next week, we have Paul Martin on Punch, Kick, Choke, and Chat. Paul Martin is certainly the most reputable, the highest honored sword evaluator, Japanese sword evaluator uh, of all non-Japanese and possibly um, possibly the most respected sword evaluator living um, uh, 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 gentleman who is not from Japan, but who has lived there for many years, also a martial artist, very accomplished, um, incredibly famous in the world of swords. So it's a little bit of a left turn for us here at Punch, Kick, Choke, and Chat. But if you, listen, everybody likes swords. Yes. Not that many people know enough about them. This is one way to really fill in your knowledge and meet somebody who's just an, he's been incredibly generous and kind to me over the years. Um, so uh, yeah, if you are a martial artist and you like swords, and I can't imagine you don't, tune in next week when we interview Paul Martin. I can't wait for that. And I just want to say thanks to some people who helped make this happen. Robert Shlumsky, Mike Russell, Victoria Feth, Justin Shea, Alden Adair, Andre Sedeshev. Uh, and thank you so much for watching, everybody. Thank you, Sensei Terrio. And to everybody out there, be safe. We'll see you in a week. And uh, we love you all for tuning in. Salut, thank you all. Have a nice thank evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care.